Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Good evening, everyone. My name's Chris, and I'm alcoholic. Hi, Chris. Uh, thank you very much for asking me to share, Wayne. Uh, thank you very much for sponsoring me, Dave. Thank you for all your support through the time that you've been sponsoring me as well. Um, I've learned so much through you, and uh, but the thing is, is, you know, I've had to, you know, surrender myself to listening to someone else, and I've, I never used to do that when I was drinking, when I was out there doing it my way. I just, my experience was my experience. I, I didn't have any room for anybody else's experience. I didn't, I wouldn't take it on board. And if I did take it on board, I was just saying it to your face and never, never do anything about it. And, uh, today I can listen to people today, employers, you know, people that have been experiencing certain aspects of life. I can take it on board and I do draw from, from these things as well. And where I never used to, and, and, and it and enriches my life because of it. And, and I can move forward, you know, where I wouldn't have before, you know, I'd have been stuck on my own thoughts, doing it my way. And, uh, it, I've got a very sick mind, you know? And so, you know, very grateful to be here. And, uh, you know, it's, it's my 10th birthday just passed. And, uh, it's, it's a day at a time. It, to anybody who's, who's new, it, it is a day at a time. It's, you know, it's just 10 years worth of days at a time. So, um, it's so important to keep it in the day, to just remember that you only have to deal with today. And I, I, f- I forget that, you know, all the time. You know, it's, it's not about, you know, coming in here being perfect. My experience is, you know, you just, I won't be perfect. You know, I've got, just got this program that I can, um, just, just use, you know, instead of, you know, do it my way, I can use this and live life happily. Um, I'm, I'm free, um, from, you know, how I, my mind works. You know, I was just, I was just emotionally just bankrupt. I just, you know, I didn't know how to do life at all. And when I picked up drink, like Jackie was saying, I, I just felt so right at that time. I just felt so right. And where before I was just worrying about, I was getting into like my, my teens and I was worrying about everybody and what they thought of me all the time. And, and the way I was thinking, it was like, it was never anything good that you were thinking about me either. And I've gone through life, um, for all my life thinking that, you know, and it's not, you know, it's not good. It's not, I would always dr- drift, like it says in the book, drift into more of a reflection. And when I've done that in my recovery as well, I've, I've just focused, you know, on things that, you know, are just, I've been taught not to do. And, and without a sponsor, you know, and me being honest, it's a two way thing. It's, it's, it, I wouldn't, I would be there just magnifying problems all the time and just they're blowing them up out of proportion. And, but with a sponsor, they're able to, you know, just, well, you know, look at it this way instead of just carrying on that way. And it's like, it is amazing. It really is to have the, have that option. And, uh, with me, um, my drinking, it, it started early. It was, it was cider and it was, uh, it was with my mates. I was, I used to be the class clown, always just, I was just laughing, taking the mick out of everything, you know. I remember going to my, um, my mate's funeral and I was like, he died of overdose and I was like making, trying to make my, my mates laugh, you know. I just didn't have, a conception of it. I just don't know how to act. You know, I was just a, like a, like a child all the time. And, and that's even though up to, you know, before I come in, well, no, <laughs> it is now really, but, uh, I don't, you know, I know when to be a child. Well, no, I know, <laughs> it's not right. I know, I know how to act in, in, at certain times. And, uh, you know, there's, you can have a laugh, you know, when, at certain times. So, uh, Christ, get out of that one. Uh, keep it simple. Right. Uh, yeah. Carried, carried on drinking with my friends. And, um, I just, I started losing, losing my, 
my uh, sense of humor. I started being really sensitive. I could never take a joke. It was, you know, it, it just hurt me. It just goes straight in. I could, oh, I'm laughing at everybody else, but you say something about me, Christ, I'll keep it, I'll keep it there for, forever, you know? And I, and when I was carrying on through my drinking, I was just getting worse and worse. It was getting, it was getting through to me more and more. Like, and I was just living just in a, just miserable, but the drink, it just gave me that. It just, it lit me up. It just gave me this, this freedom from, from these thoughts. I didn't know this at the time. I didn't know what was going on. I was just going along just, just on its own, you know, just not even thinking about it. I was just living to drink. And it was, these things were happening and I was just drinking and drinking. And day, daily I was drinking for about on and off, well, for about 10 years. And, uh, when I got with my missus, I wasn't, I wasn't able to, to do this anymore. I wasn't able just to, just to pick up a drink whenever I want, you know, just stay in bed till three o'clock, go up the shop and get me, get me cider. I wasn't able to do this anymore. And it completely changed. And, um, I wasn't able to just, uh, you know, live the way I wanted to and hide away. I wasn't able to hide away anymore, you know, just, just slink off into my bedroom or slink off just into my own mind, you know, just hide away. Just, you know, I was having to be, out all the time, you know, just trying to think of others, trying to, you know, be responsible. And it just, I just didn't have anything there to draw from, you know, I just, from, I was so selfish, really selfish, only had room for myself. I, all I could think about was, was myself and how things affected me. Impatient, intolerant, uh, you know, all these things I've learned today. I was just, I was just, I was just suffering from all these things that I just didn't know about, you know, and, uh, it was, it was just painful for me and for the people around me. And I remember I was just like selfish. I would just, I would just sit there drinking. I would, I would start speaking after, after a while because I would just be coming out of myself, starting to feel that buzz. And I'll be saying, you know, to my missus, oh, listen, can we have sex now? Like that sort of thing. And just like, not just sitting there having a, like, a pleasant talk with her and seeing how she's doing and stuff like that. It was, it was just a selfish, you know, sitting there. And I don't know, I don't know why she kept, kept with me. I really don't. And, uh, my children, they just had, they had no, nothing from me. They had no love. They had no, you know, none of my time. I was just really just, you know, in there for myself. And I would wake up in the morning just, just banging an ache. I'll be on the fucking set with a roly stuck to my lip or something like that. Or my finger burnt just there like that. And, uh, bottles everywhere, bottles of pee and stuff. I would be going out the back. My missus, oh, <laughs> my missus, I remember she said, I would just open up the back door and I'd just be peeing out the back door. I'd just do it all the time. Look at, I remember my missus, she goes, <laughs> She goes, that bloody tomcat's been around again. She used to say that this, it stinks of pee out there. I was like, bloody tomcat keep coming out there. No, I was just saying, I was, honestly, it's just flooded out there. I was just saying, what the hell is this freaking tomcat like that or something? She must have thought. But, um, but yeah, I was just, I was just, just manky. I was manky. I just never looked after myself. Never, never, especially when I was drinking on my own, I would be just in my, in my bedroom, just not washing. Maybe if I was to go out on the Saturday, I would have a drink, I would just go out like that, I would scrape my pants off, like, get you know, just, just been, sorry, right, all right, I was just, you know, just, I'm just trying to like, just, I was just disgusting, I was just a, you know, I was just, you know, I'm not a part of you, <laughs> yeah, like I said, shaking his head, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I was just, I was just, just disgusting and drink, you know, it just took, you know, it just took everything from me. It really did. I was just, I was just slow full. I used to just sit there and worry about things and not do anything about it. And I was, I just had these feelings of, of something bad was going to happen. And like I said, I would magnify all, all my problems. So I was just stuck there with no way out, no, no, just, you know, no channel. I couldn't channel anything anywhere. It was all inside me. I couldn't speak to my parents. I couldn't speak to anybody because I was just, I was just, it was just so mashed up in my head that I just didn't know where one problem started and where they ended. And it was just, I was just so frustrated. And 
it says in the book, irritable, restless, and discontent. That is just so bang on. That is really just explains me to a T. Without the drink, I'm, I'm so irritable. I'm just, you know, it's like the granny's in front of me in the shop or whatever. It's like, hurry up. Like, can't they chuck her out of the way, like sort of thing. I was just, just so irritable in yourself. It's just, you know, just so, just restless and nothing's making you happy. Nothing hits the spot, you know? Quick fixes. It's, it's, it was just crap, you know? I just didn't know what I didn't, didn't know, you know? And I've come to AA and it's just, it saved my life. It's, truly saved my life. I'll come to a point where I was rocking, crying with the drink, you know, just crying. I was just asking God, you know, I would always just, you know, feebly ask him when I was either in the cell or um, really just thinking I was going to die or what have you. And I'll be just there crying to him, you know. And other times I would think, God, I would remember my, my missus' mum would go to church and I thought, oh, she, oh, she thinks, oh, she's so weak. Honestly, I just, why can't you just, you know, be, be your own person and just, you know, but honestly, by being in this group and in, in changing and in, in getting higher power in my, in my life, I've just, I've become more courageous, more stronger as, as a person. Uh, I've got more, I've got morals, you know, principles. I didn't have nothing. I had nothing. And I, I was just fearful of everything. I was fearful to go forward in my life. I was fearful to, you know, speak to people. Just normal things that people take for granted. I was just, that was just me. And, you know, coming into AA to, to, to listen to you lot, to say that I used to drink like this, you know. They weren't telling me, right, have you done this? Have you done that? How much you drunk? Like, and stuff like that. Because at the end of my drinking, the last two years, I wasn't drinking every day anymore. And I thought, I thought, no way, I can't, I can't have this, what you were talking about. I can't be as free, I can't have this gift that you've got, because I didn't drink every day at the end. You know, I, every time I picked it up, it was just disaster. And I would say sorry, sorry to everybody I had out in the family, and I wouldn't drink. I would, I would just get over the effects. I remember I was getting stomach cramps where I'm just drinking so much and then giving up and then drinking loads again and just giving up. And I was, I was just so ill. I would get over that illness and then I would pick that drink up again once I'm fe- just feeling a little bit better. And I would think, I truly thought that it would be all right this time and that I'll be able to handle it. And it's, it's beautiful to hear that, honestly. I, it's just so like refreshing because I just, I didn't know any of this. You know, I just didn't know that loads of people in this, on this earth have been suffering from this. You know, I've been in, on my own drinking, just not knowing anything, just so distorted. My thoughts, just dark thoughts all the time, thinking that I'm, I can't get out of this and I'm the only person who's like this. Come to AA, to this group, not to, Oh, I won't start. I won't go there. Right? Uh, I'll come to this group, and they were they were fully armed with the facts of this illness, you know. And they said, you know, bang, bang, bang. I couldn't look anywhere else. I couldn't like couldn't say, well, what about this and that? And they were just like smashing it. They were just honestly, I loved it. In my in the early years of my sobriety, they were they were been brilliant. You still are now. You still are now. <laughs> I'm gonna get chinned after this, but. Uh, Oh, it was, I think because it was all new and it was all, you know, it was, it was fantastic to hear it, you know. A bit the ego, you know, reduction of the ego. I need to surrender, you know, all this, you know, and, uh, learning it and, you know, but you can learn it. I have all this information, but you, you don't have, you haven't got that surrender in yourself. You, you know, it's, I don't know. I've, I've had that surrender, so I don't know what it's like for, if you can just make that yourself, I don't know, but whatever, whatever. But uh, it's, as long as you beat, as long as you beat, which which I was, I was just truly, truly beaten. And once I heard, you know, all the, the parts of the illness that, you know, it, it would just get worse. And I, I knew that it would get, I had the clarity of once they told me everything to just look at my own drink and at my own history that I've got this illness, alcoholism. I suffer from it. Once I pick up that drink... I can't stop. I've got no control. It says little control. I've got no control, you know, over it at all. I'm, I'm just, I, and I couldn't never see it. I could never see that I didn't have that control. And my missus could. She was, you know, she said, every time you pick a drink up, you go mental with it. You just can't 
you know, regulate it. You just can't. No, I just, I would just argue saying, oh, just honestly, I just couldn't see it. And that is a part of the illness, you know? I was just, I was just insane first, around that first drink. And I would just pick it up, set off a craving, you know, that I just wanted to get more and more, you know, higher and higher in myself, like sort of thing. And, but at the end of it, I just wanted to be blacked out. That's where I wanted to be. I just wanted to be in the state of just away from me. I couldn't, couldn't live in my, in my head anymore. I just, I couldn't do it. I'll be swearing at myself. I'll be just arguing myself. I was just so scared f- with myself. I was just so fragile. I just couldn't handle anybody else's problems on top of mine. Like, it's just, just go away. I can't handle anybody else. Just, I'm thinking about my own stuff here. Like, and that's all I would do. Think, think, think. You know, I'll come into AA and they just, they've shown me, they've shown me how to not be that person anymore, you know? They've, they've shown me how to live a different way, a different way, if I wanted it, and I wanted it, you know? And sometimes, you know, I've, it says, look in the book, and Wayne says it, like, um, you're in that cave, you're in that dark cave, and you just can't find any way out, and there's somebody there that has been in that cave, and they, they can come in and guide you out, you know? They can guide you out of that cave, out of that darkness, but, it's the thing is, it's like, it just, when you think about it, it's like, I can't see how I'm going to get out of this. You know, I'm so deep in this and I'm always going to be unhappy. Always going to be unhappy. How can I get what you've got? And it's honestly, it's true. That surrender is the, the gift. It is true, true. It's such a gift that you can just let go of your own thinking, your own, you know, self will that you just go, right, what do I have to do? And you can go, you can just quite easily go out and they can just, fo- you can just follow them to, to the sunlight, you know, and it's, I've just got to keep remembering that when I, I do go into those, those, you know, those times when I'm, I'm feeling down and I'm, I'm magnifying, I'm projecting, I'm, I'm, you know, looking backwards to see, you know, reflecting, morbid reflection. It's just, I was speaking to Andy P, he was saying about, you know, just keep it in the day. And when he was sharing it, it was just, it's, honestly, I'll, I'll just take all this, you know, I'll take it from my own recovery, you know. It's just, I've, I've got to listen, I've got to listen to all this. And it's, it is truly, you know, it is amazing. But I'll do it my own way, it's, it is so painful, it's so painful. Painful, to, like I said, for the people around me, I'm not giving myself to them, I'm quiet, you know, I'm just, I'm just, I'm, I'm a nothing, I'm dead inside. Like the girl, the girl said on, on the Tuesday meeting, I've got a hole in my soul. I've got a hole there. And I, I, by doing this program, it is, it feels so perfect. You know, it just feels so perfect that, you know, it's, I feel so spiritually bulletproof that nothing, nothing can hurt you. You know, I feel, where before I feel like everything's hurting me. Everything's going in all the time. I just can't shake it. I just can't. I'm just going to explode all the time. I've got no, you know, I'm, where's the old days where I could just drink and just forget about it all and just, ah, uh, like, ah, oh, they ain't so bad. You know, I'll, I'll get that, that glow over me, that, that ease and comfort rush up right through me. Ah, like, oh, they ain't so bad, like that. But after, I'm just resentment, resentment, resentment. I can't deal with it. I'm just so so angry, I'm, I'm never going to be happy because I'm stuck in resentment. I'm stuck there in the darkness, hating you. And I've, I've been able to, you know, come out of so many things that I would have just gone dived into to really down, you know, really down if, if I didn't do this program. If I didn't, you know, I've got an illness, you know. I've got a program to combat that illness. You know, I've got to use it, you know, and it works. That is, you know, all, I'll speak all, you know, saying all these words. At the end of the day, it works. That is, that is the massive thing about all this. It works. So any newcomers, I know it's like, yeah, but I don't like this. I don't like that. And do you like what you got? You know, it's like, it's just nothing. If I, speaking off my own back, it's like, I've got nothing with, without this spiritual awakening. You know, without this power that I've got from this program and my higher power, you know, I've got nothing. I've, you know, when I've, 
the times when I haven't done my program properly, especially it was been lately as well. Especially, I've got a baby now. You know, I've been like, yeah, going, yeah, I can't wait to have this baby. And like, oh my god, I'm doing my editing at the moment. <laughs> Honestly, it's just I don't want to be horrible. I love him to bits. I really do. But it's just so it, it's tipped our world upside down. It's so unmanageable. You know, it really is unmanageable. Um, our lives at the moment. But I'm coming out of that. I feel now. I'm, I'm being more honest. Like, uh, this is all coming from, you know, this is my experience, you know. It, it's from, from pain, from happiness. You know, we, Wayne says, you know, we've, we, you, you can learn from our, our experience, you know. It's the great disciplinarians uh, in AA. It's, it's great love and great pain, you know. And I've, I've had it, had it all. And, and we, we've, we've got to share this, you know. We've got to give this away to the, to the new person. So then you can, then you can draw from that. And then, and feel that like everything's going to be all right. It's going to be all right. I've carried on doing this, you know. And it's, I'm so lucky. I really am so lucky. And it's just, I just want to just keep it in the day now. Keep it in the day. Work with work with newcomers more, you know. I've got to get, I've got to get close to my power. You know, I used to be just so full on with, my, you know, just I got higher power. Everything I was, I was, I really was. I was like just speaking to him all the time. Just <laughs> going, I, I would say go mental, but I was getting better. I feel, and it was like it was just, you know, we we have uh, old colleagues. We've got, I believe, we've got so much potential in us that we can, you know, we you're drinking, you you know, you're at home, you you're dying, you're just you you're, you're living in darkness, but you do this program, and there's just there's just so much potential, so much, you know, life out there. It's like my sponsor says to me, it's like, you know, when I'm feeling, I'm feeling a bit down in that. He says, Chris, you're so close to being happy. And it's like, it's like, yeah, I am so close to being happy. All I have to do is just these certain things. And because he's on the outside of what I'm going through, he can, he can just see it. He can just see that you just do this, do that. And it's, it's just, it's as simple as that. But when you're in it, it's, it's all consuming, isn't it? It's just, it's just, yeah, but I can't, you know, I can't, but I've just got the gift of just, just shut up, Chris. Do, do what you're told to do and everything will be alright, you know? And it's, I never had that before. I never had these, you know, promises. I didn't have any promises at all, you know? And it is, you know, it's just, I'm just so grateful to have it. How long have I got, mate? Four minutes. Four minutes. So, right. So I'll just, Coming to AA, I uh, didn't have my missus for a year. You know, I didn't want to be with her. You know, I didn't want to get back. I just, I was start, I was getting, I feel like, oh, I've got a new life now. You know, just, I want to, I, I may be able to do, you know, do stuff now. You know, and like, just get on my life. Like, but then I got back with her. You know, I want, I, I did want to get back with her. We got back, the kids got back with the kids, and it was just, I've been able to. Be such a better father. And I'm not just saying that. It's just for anybody who is, who is a father, you, honestly, you do this program and you can, you can give out so much. You, you'll be more of an attractive person. Your, your personality will come out. You know, you just, you've got so much to give that you just can't see it. You know, it's just, there's just so much in you that you just can't see it. And by doing these things, going through the 12 steps, you know, the, the program of recovery, you know, if, if you haven't even gone through it or you've just gone, you know, I'm not knocking you at all, you know, at all. But I just would love it if you could just come in and just everybody would just do those 12 steps and then decide. Like, you oh, know, maybe it's not for me. Like, so I don't think you'll be saying that, you know, if you're doing it, if you're doing it wholeheartedly, properly, you know, it's, I'll come in and I was uncomfortable, really uncomfortable. I never used to socialize without a drink. Even when I was drinking, I would just feel so down that I couldn't look people in the eyes. I couldn't, I couldn't socialize anyhow. I was just so, just uncomfortable everywhere. I remember I would just be upstairs. My missus' parents would uh, come in. Anybody, any of her family relationships, I'll be upstairs. I'm not, I won't socialize. I would always do it. And I would, like, all you did, oh, where's Chris? Like that. And I'm like, oh God, like that. I just, I just can't get on with people. Go through recovery. I had to start pushing myself. I had to start acting in a different way, you know. Uncomfortable, yeah, but you know, I started acting instead of thinking about stuff. Honestly, that is that is the main thing. It's just start acting, not thinking about stuff. 
Because you'll always think yourself out of it. If you've got, if you've got alcoholic thinking, you always think yourself out of it. You know? So it's always about trusting your higher power, whatever that is. Don't have to be God, whatever. Whatever makes sense to you. Just, just trust him. He'll give you the power. Or she. (laughs) He'll give you the power. And then you can just use the actions and just, the world's your oyster. It really is. And, uh, I really appreciate you asking me to share and I'll leave it there. Thanks. Good evening, everybody. Uh, my name's Johnny. I'm an alcoholic. I've got a battery of things in front of me. Terry, I hope they're turned on. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, thank you very much to my home group for inviting me to share tonight. And thank you, Terry. Terry's our A&R man. Um, Arash probably knows what an A&R man is involved in the music industry. It's artists and repertoire. Well, um, I'm afraid my repertoire is very limited, and you'll probably work out what sort of an artist I am when you when you listen to my story. But uh, yeah, th- thanks, thanks very much. I'm like the others. I'm very grateful to be here, and I'm really grateful to them for for sharing their message tonight because uh, my story is uh, very very different in some ways, but in other ways it's exactly the same. Um, I'm sharing because uh, uh, I've been coming to this group for quite a long time now. Um, see up there, uh, this wonderful meeting first started in 1994, um, and I've been coming here for the last 15 years. So uh, the old timers have probably had to put up with hearing me at least uh, 45 times, I should think, over that period. And uh, but uh, as I say, I've only got one story, and uh, it's how I got here, what happened when I did, and uh, what my life's like now. And um, I started drinking, well, pretty much like the others did, when uh, when I was about 16 or 17. And uh, my friends and I, we lived, I lived in Bristol then, uh, sort of found a pub with an accommodating landlady who'd actually serve us in the back bar. Um, I shall be 63 years old uh, at the end of this month, and the reason I mention that is because when I started drinking, the whole culture around alcohol was, was rather different to how it is now. Um, drink was something that everybody did. I remember I had my, my first drink uh, probably when I was about three years old. Uh, my family, my two sisters and my mum and dad and I used to go out and see my grandparents who lived about uh, 15 miles away from home in Bristol. And uh, just before we all packed up to go home at the end of the day, uh, my dad and, and my grandfather had a beer together and my mum and my gran had a, had a glass of sherry. And uh, my sisters and I were given an egg cup full of Stone's ginger wine with a spoonful of sugar in it. <laughs> And um, I really didn't like it very much. <laughs> it didn't have an immediate effect on me, other than the, you know, the scald of the ginger going down. But uh, you know, it, <laughs> it, it it wasn't anything special. Um, but what I did notice as I grew older was that um, you know, alcohol was always around when people seemed to be having a good time. You know, when my parents were having parties. And uh, as my older sister was growing up, and I was about three or four years younger than her, you know, she, uh, you know, when she got to 17 or 18, she and her friends used to go off to the pub, and uh, it all seemed incredibly glamorous, and, uh, you know, that's what I wanted to do. It was almost a part of sort of growing up to, to you know, get served in a pub then. And um, in those early days, it was something that I did with, with friends of mine, you know, it was almost socially acceptable and um, to be honest I don't think there were any really serious consequences I've never drink much more than a pint and a half maybe two um, this was by the time I was 17 18 something like that um, but uh, it began to take off a bit when I went to uh, went to university at the age of 18 I guess and uh, that's really when I started becoming a, a, a daily drinker again it wasn't you know enormous quantities but it was something that I did every day and it remained that way uh, for getting on the next thirty odd years, um, because if you're new, um, you know, you may have worked out by now that this is what's called a, a progressive illness. Um, 
it's an illness that actually tells you it, you don't have it. Um, and uh, I didn't realize that, of course. You know, I, uh, I just carried on as normal. Uh, but when I reached my mid-twenties, you know, I, uh, I got a job, I got, went to university, I got a career, uh, moved away from home, and um, alcohol began to play more and more of a part in my life. You know, there was the, we used to go to the pub at lunchtime, and we used to go to the pub again after the, the, at the end of work. And, uh, um, you know, there were some of these client lunches which sort of tended to last until five o'clock in the evening, and then uh, you'd roll straight over to that in the pub. And uh, it, again, it, uh, I mentioned this because it was all, almost an, an acceptable, you know, sort of way of doing things, certainly in the, in the business that I was in. The last ten years of my drinking, uh, it had taken on a, 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 a totally different phase. Um, I was drinking then, I thought, because uh, I was under pressure at work. Uh, well, let's just leave it at that. But, um, you know, I was beginning to drink in the mornings, you know, to uh, to steal myself for the, you know, the problems that lay ahead in the day. Just thinking, just the one, you know, it'll do me through till lunchtime and I know I shouldn't do it, but I couldn't stop myself. And, um, but inevitably, um, that one always seemed to lead to another, usually earlier than the day, in the day than I'd expected it to. And that tended to lead to another, despite the fact that, you know, it was only just going to be that one or two until the evening, and that would be fine. And that was, you know, that was the beginning of the last phase. Um, it was the beginning of my alcoholism, I, I think, as we understand it. Because as you all picked up from, you know, the other speakers, one of the things that makes me an alcoholic is that uh, once I start drinking, it sets some some sort of reaction off inside me, which is different from the normal temperate drinker. I have an allergic reaction to alcohol that doesn't bring me out in spots or anything like that, but uh, I need another one. And, uh, you know, that one other one or two or three are going to be inevitable once I pick up that first one. The other thing that makes me an alcoholic is the fact that uh, when I pick up that first one that is only just going to be that one, I inevitably forget about what happened the last time. This time it will be all right. You know, I, it'll just be that one. And as I say, everything that happened after the last drinking spell will will just evaporate from my mind. I'm on autopilot once I think of picking up that first drink. I will get it whatever happens. I didn't see any of that happening at the time. I thought I was drinking, you know, maybe more than my friends did, but um, I was continuing to hold down a job, you know, I was thought continuing to behave reasonably responsibly, and uh, to be honest, I thought I was getting away with it. And by this sort of deluded mental thing, so long as I was getting away with it, it couldn't be that bad. But um, stranger and stranger things, you know, began to happen, you know, when uh, when I was drinking. Um, I'm sure if you're here tonight, you'll know just what I mean. You know, I sort of well, I won't I won't start to describe them, but uh, you you'll know, I'm sure. Uh, but again, I um, nothing that happened was was sufficient to enable me to leave alcohol alone. I tried lots of times to cut down, you know, haha, -ha. it was the first day of Lent yesterday, you know, the number of times I was going to give up drinking for Lent, the number of times I listened to colleagues and saw colleagues at work who actually did give up drinking for 40 days. I probably last four days tops. Um, by the end, you know, I lasted four hours between one drink and the next one. Um, I simply couldn't stop. And in the end, I, I really even stopped trying to stop. I just tried to keep it under control, I thought. And as I say, so long as nothing disastrous happened, I thought I did have it under control. I, my drinking became very, very secretive. I, uh, I drank a lot in my car, believe it or not, and miraculously, I never got stopped or even lost my license. And that, that was a miracle. 
I mention that because if you're new, um, it was when I first started coming to these meetings, and I didn't want to be an alcoholic like you lot. I didn't think I was. But it was when people shared about the things that they did and how they thought or didn't think around alcohol, I began to identify with them. And this enormous barrier that I put up between you and me, you know, that I'm not like you, you know, I began to listen. And, well, hmm, I've done that. Um, we had a home group meeting, uh, sorry, a, ho a home group member called Mary, who doesn't come here any longer. But when she shared about how she had a selection of off licenses and supermarkets that she used to go around in a rotor, so she wouldn't go back to the same one the same day to get another bottle, thereby, you know, sort of letting everybody know, oh, she's drinking too much. I thought, I did that. You know, I, I would never go to the same off-license twice to pick up a bottle. Um, things like that. I heard my sponsor, John, thank you very much, the, ma you know, the man who's shown me what to do, the same one who showed Mike precisely what to do. I heard him sharing about, uh, you know, being at home, sort of in a different room from his wife, but trying to open the top of a can of beer without her hearing. I thought... I've done that. You know, that's me with a bottle of gin trying to get the top off without her hearing the crack of the cap. You know, it's the, it was those little things that made me realize, well, maybe I am like them. And, um, that's, if you knew, that's why we share. I've only, I've only got, you know, my one story, but I just hope that, uh, if there's anybody here who's coming back or, or, Coming to AA for the first time, you might identify with, you know, what I've got to say or certainly with what the others you're here sharing tonight have to say because, um, you know, I came to understand that I was much against my better judgment, exactly like these people I'd heard share. To cut a long story short, what, uh, what happened in the end was that I said I, I, I went into this sort of final 10 years, uh, when alcohol really had me. You know, I was, like Mike said, I was really being controlled by alcohol. Trying to, you know, to cover up, cover my tracks the whole time, uh, and just, yeah. I don't know what I, what I thought, I don't know how I thought it was going to end up, but I do remember sort of sitting occasionally at the end of the evening just thinking everything is just so pointless. Why am I, you know, why am I carrying on like this? You know, why, why can't I cut down on my drinking? Why don't I want to, why don't I, why can't I not want to drink? I simply, I simply didn't understand. As I say, life, life seemed pointless. I tried cutting down, tried stopping, couldn't do it. And all I could hope for was that something would turn up. You know, something would change, some, something might turn up, but, by the end of my drinking, uh, my wife and family, my two kids, who were 12, 12 and a half and 10, were at the end of their tether because they didn't know what I was going to be like when I came home in the evenings. You know, I, I wasn't physically violent, but I was bloody minded and, you know, I was not really nice to be with. They got in the way of my drinking, as I say, I was trying to cover it up and I didn't want to get found out and any suggestion, you know, that I might be drinking a bit too much, you know, just got rebuffed out of, out of hand. Uh, I wasn't having any of it. Uh, and with that came all sorts of guilt. You know, it's, it's tiring living a life like that. It, it was, uh, well, if you're here, you've probably been through it. So, uh, we know just what it's like. Eventually, something did turn up, uh, and uh, it wasn't how I expected it at all. It was uh, collapsing in the car park of my office at about 11 o'clock on a Friday morning, having, you know, had my first drink on almost as soon as I sort of got out of bed, um, but it finally caught up with me. Uh, I collapsed. I was taken home by, uh, by the people from the office, put to bed, the doctor came, didn't, I didn't know what was happening, basically. Uh, and uh, even I realized that, uh, you know, the truth was out. I couldn't cover this up anymore. And um, 
my wife, bless her, and my older sister, who known far more about what was going on than I had, um, sort of swung into action because they'd just been waiting for something like that to happen. Um, I went to a, uh, a rehab, to a treatment center uh, up in Western Supermare. Um, that was a relief, actually, because I couldn't face going back to the office and seeing them all after what had happened. And uh, I was running away. I wanted to go and hide under a stone. I felt so embarrassed by it all that, you know, I just, I just wanted out. And um, I was there for eight weeks. For eight weeks, I was separated from alcohol. Uh, and I complied with, you know, what I was asked to do. Uh, and I came to the end of that eight weeks thinking everything will be fine. Everything will go back to normal. I'll be able to drink properly. Well, they told me that, you know, I'd have to go to AA meetings and uh, I wouldn't be able to drink properly, but of course I didn't believe them. I thought, you know, uh, hope for the best, but uh, probably fear the wor for the worse. Um, fortunately, I met another member of this wonderful home group while I was there, uh, who'd been through the same place uh, a little while before I had, who'd come back for an open day. And I'd asked the staff there if they had anybody coming from Plymouth, uh, and perhaps they could introduce me to them. And um, I'm very grateful to uh, to Gail, uh, who led a parallel life to me because our stories are pretty similar. Um, who said, uh, "Well, you know, you'll be told when you come out, you've got to come to to AA. Why don't you try, you know, my group? It's got a reputation for being a bit strict, um, but it's okay." And so that's why I turned up um, at my f road to recovery meeting on a Tuesday night uh, in the middle of January, 15 years ago, uh, and I started hearing the message that was being carried tonight. Um, it was a message that I'd actually read about because the treatment centre that I went to, fortunately, worked its way round this, the book Alcoholics Anonymous. If you're new, you need that book. You don't need a treatment centre necessarily. That's just how I happened to get here. Uh, and it gave me the impetus, you know, to start coming to AA meetings, to start coming to this group, where I heard the message that you, you've heard tonight. There is a full and complete recovery. If you work those 12 steps with a sponsor, When I heard that a few times, I wasn't actually sure that I wanted it. Thank you very much. You know, I just wanted, uh, you know, to do my bit, come to AA for a few weeks, and I'm sure, you know, everything would be smoothed over. My wife would, uh, you know, see that I was trying to do the right thing and would eventually forget about, you know, the fact that I ought to come to AA meetings, and I hope the office would as well. Um, but uh, by about week two, um, the mess penny finally dropped. Um, and I took action on what the secretary will read out tonight. If there's anybody here who needs a temporary sponsor, please see me after the meeting and I will arrange one for you, or words to that effect. And um, as I say, I put my pride in my pocket and uh, asked somebody to help me. As I say, I wasn't really sure that I needed help, um, but even I realized, uh, well, I, I had come to the conclusion I couldn't honestly sit through these meetings hearing the same thing time after time after time, get a sponsor, get a big book, work the steps, without actually being seen to be trying to do something about it. So. I didn't regard myself as a, as a, as a sure bet by any manner or means when I first asked for help. But, um, I was taken to coffee after that meeting and, uh, given a daily plan of, uh, the things that everybody else had done here. Um, get a big book. Got that. Read it. Page or a chapter a day. Phone my sponsor at the time when he said every day to begin with, ring up a couple of other people, members of the group, get on my knees at the beginning of the day when I got up and ask, 
a power of my own understanding, you know, for a, for a sober day and to help me. To do, to read and to put into action what's set out on the Just for Today card, which is a wonderful little piece of literature. The whole AA 12-step program is embodied in that. If you want to practice the principles of the 12-step program, just do what's on that Just for Today card. To get a home group, um, he said, the one I go to is pretty good, and I think even I'd worked out that it was very different from other AA meetings that I'd been to. It was, well, the only meeting that I could remember were people were actually enthusiastic about not drinking, as opposed to just grimming on, ha hanging on like grim death and not drinking. This was the only place where I heard, you know, a positive message. Do these things. They will work for you, just like they've worked for us. And as I say, that, um, for one reason or other, I, you know, decided to give it a go. And my personal ex experience has been was that when I actually started to do all those things that were on that card, started to do what everybody else had been sharing that they'd done, they really did begin to work. It was quick, if you knew. You know, within three or four days of actually doing them properly, I began to feel, hmm, you know, maybe things aren't so bad after all. There was also this sense that I was actually doing what everybody else was doing. I was coming to meetings, hearing them share, and, you know, and that, that sort of bit of a leap of faith that there had been to begin with, that, mm, well, I don't think it's going to work, but I suppose I'll give it a try, you know, came the realization that, yeah, I, I was doing it, and it did seem to be working. And in just the same way that the other speakers have shared, you know, when uh, my sponsor judged it was, I was ready, he, uh, and, and doing these things, I got the first part of, well, I got step one, basically. He started to take me through the steps. Um, going through the steps, if you knew, for me, probably took about four or five months. It's one day at a time, but I mean, you know, it's, it's not something you have to queue up and get a, you know, go on a waiting list to do. Um, you know, one step progressed from the other. And uh, as I worked through the steps, you know, I changed. Just as I'd begun to change without my really realizing it so quickly at the beginning when I started putting these actions in. And that, that change has continued to evolve. When I first came here, I thought, mm, look at all these people, listen to all these people, you know, I'm not like them. But um, when I started to do the thing, same things, I realized that, yeah, I was like them, but I also realized that, you know, this message that they were carrying could work for me in the same way that it had worked for them. And um, my life has continued to change. You know, I very soon after, I, I, just as Mike shared, very soon after, you know, starting to put these actions in, um, this thought that have been, you know, when am I going to be able to take the next drink? You know, is it going to be two years? Is it going to be one year? You know, is it going to be tomorrow? You know, that all, that was removed. That was, that was quite amazing. You know, and, uh, drink ceased to be, you know, the problem that, that it had been. You know, drink, drink had always been the, you know, the relief I'd sought from all my problems and it eventually became the biggest problem you know, in, in my life, and I, I, I couldn't resolve it without help. The way I found was, by, you know, I'll say it again, was with the help of a sponsor uh, who showed me precisely what he'd done, the help of this wonderful home group, you know. I'm very fortunate that, uh, you know, as I say, I've been here for a while. It's not only been because I love coming here, um, but also, I did another thing that I never wanted to do, which was actually get involved in AA. And I've been fortunate enough to, you know, to do service almost continuously of one sort or another since, uh, since I started, well, since I got past step five, I guess. Well, in fact, I've started to do service in a very small way almost as soon as I got here. Um, but, um, yeah, I've, I've, I've done a fair bit of service at various levels in AA. Um, 
the higher power works in mysterious ways. Um, yesterday, when I got home in the evening, there was uh, a letter for me uh, from the GSO, that's the General Service Office of Alcoholics Anonymous, because uh, I was fortunate enough to have been asked to join the Literature Subcommittee. And uh, in the letter, they sent me this leaflet, which they're thinking about revising, and they've been, you know, mulling it over for months and months and months, and um, and they uh, they want some fresh eyes on it. That leaflet is called the AA Home Group. Now, as I say, that is my higher power working for me. I've been blessed with the, by the fact that I found this group. If you're new, you couldn't have come to a better place. This really is, you know, the home, the heartbeat of Alcoholics Anonymous. Recovery is here if you're prepared, willing, open, honest, open-minded enough, you know, to do the things that have suggested. It really does work, and I can't commend it highly enough, and thank you so much for all the help all of you have given me, you know, in, in my time of coming here. And um, God bless you all. Thank you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.